So hi, everybody. Thank you so much for coming to our talk. And we also wanted to thank the organizers so much for inviting us to speak to you today. Um, as uh, we were introduced, my name is Diane Benton. I'm a director of data science with uh, RBC, and I've been with the bank for about six years. I'm Joel. Uh, I'm also director of data science, and I've been at the bank for seven years. So today, our slides are going. <laughs> So today, um, we would like to talk to you about building unique client experiences at RBC through data and AI insights. And so we'll start by giving you a a uh, 30,000 foot overview of tech at RBC, as well as the Calgary Innovation Hub, which we're both part of, um, and some of our data strategy. And then we'll uh, get a little bit uh, more specific with some of the uh, stuff that we're working on. So some of our data services, uh, the event engine and the mortgage application tracker. And then we'll talk about uh, some applications of data science to, uh, in, in the work that we do. Um, and that's the Intelligent Events to Activity Mapper, which is part of CAP, and a uh, more in-depth example of the Intelligent Email Management product. So RBC is one of Canada's largest banks, and indeed it's amongst the biggest in the world in terms of market capitalization. We have almost 100,000 employees, and more than 10% of these are, are tech employees. Um, so you may be surprised to learn that uh, a bank has such a large tech uh, employee population. And that's because uh, RBC really believes that tech is key to unlocking business value across the enterprise. We have uh, technologists who do things from cybersecurity, um, AI and machine learning, app development, and, and much, much more. And these people work in all of the lines of business across the bank on, uh, to solve business problems and provide business value. As, um, and you can see that really RBC's commitment and their, their belief in this strategy, uh, this, this data-driven strategy, um, in the, the uh, $4 billion that the bank invests annually in technology. RBC really is a great place to be a technologist. And the people there are not only running the bank, but transforming the bank. My turn. Um, so, like I mentioned, we're both part of the Calgary Innovation Hub. Uh, there are, RBC has multiple innovation hubs across the country, also in Halifax and Montreal. Um, but the Calgary Hub is the newest hub. Uh, just opened more than, uh, just over a year and a half ago, in September of 2021. And we actually just passed 150 employees. So the hub is, is growing very quickly and continuing to grow. Um, and actually, RBC believes specifically that Calgary has a, has a great tech ecosystem and that the partnerships are here um, to you know, really build our tech footprint. Um, and, and actually, I'm also a born and raised Calgarian. I guess that wasn't in my bio, but I'm, I'm very happy to be back home in Calgary. Um, so why build uh, regional innovation hubs? Simply, RBC thinks that it makes sense to align our tech talent across the country. Um, traditionally, there's lots of tech footprint in the head office in Toronto, uh, but the creation of the innovation hubs is really to align talent with all of Canada. Um, like I mentioned, you know, not only Calgary, but across the country, there are uh, good technologists. And in addition to being good for, um, good for business, that RBC thinks it's good for the country, for our clients, uh, and, and Canada in general to, to have good uh, tech jobs across the country. Um, specifically, and I can speak from experience having um, back to the hub a few months ago, one of the opportunities with regional hubs is to build uh, a different kind of uh, relationship between the business and technology where, um, you know, if you're a technologist in Toronto, you definitely don't have the same kind of relationship with, say, someone out in the field in a branch in, in Calgary. Um, whereas now with the, the innovation hub, actually our space right now is co-located in Bankers Hall with the kind of regional banking uh, office, and we can build um, 
you know, relationships, specifically focused on innovation to try to find new opportunities. I think that's a big part of data science is, is uh, changing the bank or transforming the bank. Uh, so it's a great opportunity, you know, to, to connect with regional partners in a way that, that hasn't been done before. Okay, so we have uh, many tech positions within the RBC Calgary Innovation Hub. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about the work. We do have teams. Um, they're all, within the hub, they're all uh, technologists, but across multiple teams within technology. Um, so including, but not limited to uh, the actual infrastructure that uh, our technology solutions run on top of, uh, cybersecurity, um, digital, so that would include things like online banking and mobile application, as well as uh, Diana, part of the uh, data and analytics of the enterprise department around data. So within all of those teams, we have basically the whole gamut of tech um, roles. I won't read the whole slide for you, but we're both data scientists. Uh, we have data engineers, DevOps people, designers, probably anything you can think of, uh, even if it's not depicted there, uh, we, we probably have someone uh, with those skills as well. Okay, so zooming one level deeper, I mentioned we're both part of uh, data analytics, and I think that a big uh, differentiator for RBC, in addition to a focus on tech, specifically a focus on data and our data platform strategy, uh, and this really sort of shows up in a lot of the work in our department, you can see that there's, there's three pillars. Um, the first is to evolve our data foundation to support many business workload patterns on a minimum number of technology environments. And that really reflects two, I think, truths about maybe tech in general. Um, one is that you have a variety of applications and, and workloads, um, whether it's you know, operational systems like ATMs, um, online banking, back office systems, uh, managing loans and deposits, on and on, um, or analytical workloads, uh, some of which we'll be talking about where we might reuse data from an operational context to provide a good client experience, personalize the client experience, um, increase you know, operational efficiency. But there's, there's a wide variety of workloads. There's also a wide variety of technology. You know, every year there's a new latest and greatest, whether it's operational or you know, analytical, machine learning. Actually, Diane will, will briefly mention large language models later. That's, that's pretty big news. Uh, but, but, you know, text changing. So this first pillar is really about handling that variety. And that part of the strategy is to find uh, standards and reusable solutions so that, uh, you know, we're not always reinventing the wheel. Um, and, and that people can focus on solving business problems rather than um, kind of a, a big, um, wide variety of technology in use. Um, actually, I want to say one more thing on, on that first pillar, which how that's reflected, for example, in data and analytics is um, within our department is manage the enterprise data warehouse environment uh, that sits on top of Teradata. And actually that's probably the biggest footprint within uh, our department uh, has been there for more than two decades. Um, that's still very heavily used and there's lots of value in it. Um, it drives workloads like traditional reporting and you know, business intelligence, things like that. Um, we also have a uh, enterprise data lake environment running on Hadoop. Um, it's used for you know workloads like ad hoc analytics, data science, uh, big data transformation, etc. And here's where I'll kind of move over to the, the second pillar. A big part of our um, tech platform is focused on supporting analytics engines and data services, and that's where uh, most of our work lines up. Uh, and specifically, data services that are reusable in an organization as big as ours. Um, there are lots of opportunities to build something once and then reuse it in many contexts, whether that's data um, or a analytical capability um, or maybe you know just a general business API. Um, so we'll, we'll be probably elaborating, actually really the rest of the talk, we'll be elaborating on some examples of, of data services. Um, and then finally, the third one, of course, sometimes there will be business needs that need you know, a very specific solution. Um, and, and the third pillar is recognizing that kind of work through projects or data squads if there's a specific need for specific data or a specific you know, application or, or use case. Okay, so the, the first example we want to talk about is the event engine. So this is one of the reusable data services. Um, what it does is it captures and streams event data in real time. And traditionally in a lot of, of you know, organizations, um, data processing could be done in batch. Um, and, and 
for example, monthly or weekly or daily or intraday. And that, that works for a lot of uh, use cases, but definitely if you want to do the sort of most possible, uh, either in terms of personalizing client interactions and you know, providing the right message at the right time, or uh, understanding sort of the entire picture of, of events going on in the business, uh, real time is really a, a added value. So what the event engine does is it's a platform that can be connected to any source system. Um, again, say online banking, transactions, et cetera, and they publish these events in a standard format to the event engine so that they're uh, providing a centralized view of all the interactions across the bank in real time. Um, that lets you, I already mentioned, kind of deliver uh, real-time customer experiences or, or even employee experiences, actually, the example we're going to give is sort of helping employees, which, which also helps um, customers, as well as uh, if you have a picture of the whole you know, either a business process, front to back, kind of across all systems, or a, a client journey, end to end, uh, say you're applying for a mortgage, all the way from starting the application, filling out the application, uh, submitting it, it, going through adjudication, and then finally the mortgage being funded. Um, you know, you can have a picture of that whole process. And then uh, once you have that, then you can do analytics and, and drive insight, things like that. Uh, so the event, the event engine, in some sense, is the core of a lot of uh, what we'll talk about. Uh, so this is the first example of an application built on top of the event engine that we're going to talk about, which is the mortgage application tracker. This is a mobile app that RBC mortgage specialists can use on their RBC-enabled uh, uh, mobile device. And it, what, what it lets them do is understand the status of all the mortgage applications kind of in their book, as well as you know, information about the applications, contact information. Um, as well, it has uh, updates in real time. So if there's an uh, update, you know, they can both pull or, or look up uh, information, or if, for example, the mortgage gets funded, an event can be published and then sent as, kind of as a push notification to the app. Um, and the, the real value or the opportunity here was before this, if a mortgage specialist wanted to um, you know, understand something about the application, uh, look something up, they had to uh, log in on their laptop. So this allows it to be right in their pocket. You know, if they're walking between meetings, if they're on the go, um, it's, it's really a, a big benefit uh, for more specialists. And the way it works, um, you know, it says it on the slide, but the way uh, it works is that the event engine receives events from the backend mortgage application systems and makes them reusable so that this is a, another application built on top of that uh, that could just access uh, those events in real time. And, and the outcome is, is really a better experience for the mortgage specialists. They can spend more time on value-added activities like interacting with clients rather than you know, opening up their laptop to, to find new information and, and that gives a better client experience. Um, actually, the last thing I want to mention about this, I love starting with this one because it's a very simple example, but I want to emphasize like the value sometimes is just in making the data available. Before we talk about you know, analytics, machine learning, um, fancier things, if you want to put it that way, like, there's, there's real value in just making data available and reusable in different contexts. Uh, the next uh, reusable data service is PATH, and this is something built on top of the event engine. So the event engine, uh, we have multiple millions of events per day, whether it's uh, interactions on the website, uh, transactions, status changes in applications, um, but that you know, over time, that means we have billions of data points in the event engine. And what PATH does is allows us to stitch those together um, to understand, for example, a client journey or uh, intent business process and then draw insights from it. The way it works, it has three parts, process capture, process mining, and process insights. Uh, process capture is at a high level having standardized process documentation. So a lot of this knowledge right now is, is in the heads of you know, business subject matter experts, but this offers a, a standard place to uh, capture the, you know, the, especially the ideal version of the process how ought the process to work, or, or you know, what's our understanding of the process. Uh, and that really motivates the second point of process mining, because often you know, the ideal understanding of the process is not actually what obtains in the real world. Um, it's probably a truism and the, the, you know, data is messy. Uh, probably everyone has been talking about that. And it's true, if you look at the data, you probably don't necessarily see what you might expect from uh, understanding of the business process. So the process mining offers a, a data-driven approach to understanding really what do we see in the events. 
in, in what's going on in a client journey or, or a business process. Um, and from the first two parts, once you have process capture and process mining uh, and an understanding of really sort of the state of the business, what's going on um, in the events, then you can do process insights and try to understand, first understand things like exploratory data analysis, um, simply exploring the data, but ultimately you know, take actions, for example, to improve a process or to improve client experience. Um, you can run what-if scenarios um, and, and maybe motivate um, testing you know, changes to a business process. Uh, so PATH is, is a platform that enables all of those uh, capabilities. And actually we're going to drill into the second point on process mining with a uh, data science solution, which is the Intelligent Event to Activity Mapper. Um, what this is, uh, from a high level, is going from raw events data to business activities. And the reason is because the raw events, as they're reflected in the event engine, um, might not carry business meaning for a business subject matter expert. Right? They're kind of at a technical level and not, not at a uh, business interpretable level. Uh, so to, to kind of do the third point on the previous slide of actually drawing insights, this is almost true of you know, any data. You need to turn the data into information or something that people can interpret. Um, and to do that, we need to go from raw events to business activities. The reason that this is, uh, we'll talk about the ML in a second, but the reason that this is an ML solution is, is simply want to scale. Um, we have more than, I think more than 300, I'm not sure the exact number, um, sort of specific business processes just within um, Canadian banking operations. So there's, there's hundreds of these. And you could do this, this process I'm describing manually just with subject matter expertise and kind of going through the data and doing manual analysis. Um, but the ML solution that I'm going to talk about really makes it feasible to, to you know, do that much more quickly and maybe with, with um, allowing business subject matter experts to focus on value-added activities. So how it works is from the raw events, we do have uh, indication of which business process the raw events are related to. That's part of what we capture in the event engine. So we can filter to get common events related to one business process. Um, and then the next step is, is where machine learning comes in. We use machine learning uh, to do clustering and to infer, you know, the assumption is that these events are associated with latent um, business activities. Uh, so that's done with machine learning to, to create kind of the uh, proposed clustering. And then the final step is where we do a person with subject matter expertise um, does post processing to validate that. Because you really need, you know, if you want to use this for, for um, insight analytics, you, you need this to be correct. So the final step is some post processing. Um, I'll talk about next. Uh, so this is one example from a mortgage application. Uh, what's depicted on the slide is the output of the second step, so of the machine learning clustering. Um, in the columns are the different steps, and then the items in the columns are the raw events that the machine learning has clustered into associated uh, business activities. So what the subject matter expert would have to do after this would be exactly to name the clusters. Right now it just says step one, two, three, four, five. Uh, as well as to potentially split the cluster if there are too many, um, too many events that are, that are really part of different activities, or to combine clusters uh, if, you know, if, if they're part of the same activity. Um, and once that's been done, then you can kind of move to the third step of insight. Um, and so these are both two screenshots from the, the PATH uh, platform it could be used by you know, a business analyst or some kind of subject matter expert, not necessarily a data scientist, right? a data scientist or someone else. Someone more technical could also access the data directly. Um, but that this layer of insights also enables other kinds of users. Um, and this is really just the first level. You know, I mentioned when it comes to insights, I think the first level is, is exploratory data analysis and just understanding the data. Anytime you, you do data science, I think you have to understand. Um, explore the data first before doing anything more sophisticated, uh, for lack of a better word. Uh, so what's depicted here, um, you can see it's sort of the same kind of chart. They're both charts of cycle time of, on the left is a whole process end to end, and on the right uh, is a you know, particular step to that process. Um, and actually maybe I, I really want to emphasize, in some way this is a very simple idea, uh, but that to get to this point, kind of you, we needed to do exactly what happened before. Um, 
of, of data preparation to you know make this you know really meaningful. The data needs to be prepared correctly so that it reflects the um, the context that it's referring to. Um, so that this could be the first step, for example, in understanding what's the what's a process bottleneck that could be improved. Um, don't have any slides on it, but like I said, sort of the next step would be uh, something like what if analysis or some more like causal inference to understand you know, what would happen if we changed a particular step, how would the, uh, the business process change? I think that might be the last thing I'll present. So I'll hand it over to Diane to talk about one of our other uh, reusable data solutions. So Joel has just described the process of, well, process mining, of understanding a business process. Um, why do we want to understand a business process? Well, probably for a lot of reasons, but a really important one is to improve that process, to make it better for the users and for our clients. So that's what I'd like to talk to you about uh, right now, is a specific instance of a data solution um, uh, called intelligent email management. So what is IEM. The Intelligent Email Management Tool is a product that uses natural language processing to improve operational efficiency for email inboxes. So as you might imagine, at the bank we have a lot of email inboxes. So for example, um, you could imagine um, an email inbox with the goal of, um, so if you're a client, you can email these, this email inbox. And there's lots of reasons that you might need to email them. You could be looking for information, or you could want to uh, know the answer to a question, or you might want to make a request or change to your account. Um, and that email inbox would be a really high volume. There'd be a ton of emails coming into that email inbox because RBC has a lot of clients. Um, so it's not feasible for one person to answer all of these emails. Instead, it's a team of employees who answer an email inbox. Um, and you can also imagine that um, these email inboxes might not be limited to just uh, clients, but could also the requests and uh, uh, you know questions and stuff could come from um, uh, other RBC employees who are, for example, uh, branch advisors who are trying to help their clients. Uh, so these are the types of email inboxes that uh, the IAM product is trying to target. In addition, we want these emails to have the information inside of their body as opposed to attachments. And the goal for um, an engagement where we uh, work with one of these email inboxes is to improve the efficiency of the process as well as to reduce costs. And so. In our experience, we found that there are two sort of main buckets uh, of costs that uh, these, these in email inboxes experience. So the first is the cost of the SLA. Now, SLA stands for Service Level Agreement, and basically what it is is the contract between the email inbox team and you um, telling you how long it's going to take, how long, in, in what period of time they commit to answering your email. So for example, if an email inbox has an SLA of 24 hours, that means that within 24 hours of sending an email to them, you should expect a reply. And you can imagine that exceeding this SLA, so taking longer to answer the email, um, is costly in certain cases. For example, if you were to email and say, well, I think there's been fraud on my account, and I take you know, five days for, uh, to send you a reply, well, that's five days that the person doing fraud on your account could continue doing fraud on your account. And so that's, um, the bank would owe you money in that case. And that's, um, so that's an uh, a example of uh, how exceeding the SLA could uh, run up costs for an email inbox. The second main category of costs that we see are the cost of the people who work at the, if answering the emails, uh, so the full-time employees um, and their salaries. And um, so you can imagine that if you send an email, you'd like a human to answer you, um, to understand your email and send you a response. Um, but there's other operations or uh, tasks associated with an email inbox like this that don't necessarily require a human to do. Uh, for example, um, you could imagine that somebody uh, is taking the role of a queue manager 
who reads the emails coming in, makes sure that you know something needs to be done for these emails, and then routes them to a uh, an employee of the email inbox to answer it for you. And so we want to make sure that the people working on this email inbox are doing things that really do require a human and not tasks that uh, that don't that where humans aren't the best solution for it. Um, and I'll note that these two costs are intertwined in that you could uh, decrease one at the expense of another. So for example, you could uh, really uh, save salary costs for your email inbox if you only had one person working there, but then it would take 20 days to get an answer to your email, right? So um, we're not looking to uh, just drive one of them down, we're looking to reduce total costs. So to this end, uh, we've developed a number of different capabilities uh, for the IAM product uh, that will help us uh, improve the process of uh, getting an email. So the first thing that happens when an email comes into the email inbox is that it needs to be authenticated, the sender needs to be authenticated. And that's because I can't just email the bank and say, uh, can you make a wire transfer from this random account? Right? You want to ensure that the person asking me to carry out a wire transfer is somebody that really has the permissions to be doing that for that account. So um, this is something that could be done by a human. Right, The human could look at the sender, look at the verified email address, check it against a list to make sure that that person is really authorized for that uh, account that they're requesting information or transaction for. Um, but this doesn't necessarily need to be done by a human. So uh, IEM's authentication capability provides a way to automatically authenticate the client's identity so that we know that the person is, is okay to be asking for what they're asking for. So the next thing that we want to happen with an incoming email is that it should go to somebody who knows how to answer it. So if I'm an expert on credit cards, um, then if an email comes into our shoe manager, so this could be somebody reading the email saying, okay, I think this is about credit cards, I will send it to the credit card expert on our team. But does this, this doesn't necessarily need to be done by a human. So uh, our, our skill-based routing capability um, is looking to use NLP to understand the content um, and the intent of the email to forward it to the right person uh, for action. Now, not all of the emails that we receive necessarily require a response or an action. Um, so examples of emails that wouldn't would be out-of-office replies or uh, automatically sent uh, receipts of acknowledgement. So yes, we've received your email. Um, or the Canadian Classic, thank you so much for your help. Um, and so these types of emails don't necessarily require, they, they don't require an action from the agent. So once again, the queue manager could read that and determine that, but it's not necessary for the queue manager to do it. So uh, the, we have a capability which can identify these emails that don't require a response and deprioritize them. So to not put them in the main working queue, put them in a separate queue where uh, somebody can check them afterwards um, and, and deal with them sort of in batch. Similar to uh, deprioritizing emails, we also, there's also emails that we receive that we want to prioritize. So things like fraud, for example, are time sensitive. They need to be actioned um, in a high priority manner. And so uh, we can classify and prioritize the emails coming in, again, using uh, NLP and machine learning to identify the ones that really uh, need to be answered promptly and move them into a high priority queue. Now, when you send an email to uh, an email inbox such as this, uh, it's not necessarily just, you know, you send them an email and it's over. Oftentimes it's a back and forth conversation. So I might send an email to the email inbox and then they might tell me that I require, they require more information from me. So they send something back to me and then I'll send them the information they asked for and then they action the request and send it back to me, right? So it's, it's not just sort of one email, it's more of a conversation. And for client experience, as well as to not waste the people working on these uh, requests time, it makes sense for uh, all of the correspondence with one, in, in one request to go to the same person. So I shouldn't be talking to five different people over the course of my request. It should really be a conversation with the same person. Um, so the queue management um, auto-routing will 
uh, determine that this an email is a follow-up to a conversation that's already been happening and send it automatically to the same person, the same agent actioning the request um, to, uh, to improve the client experience. And now finally, um, so I'm sure everybody's heard the hype about um, large language models recently. And the reason that they're so cool is because they really act like they understand human language. You can talk to it and it looks like it understands English. And if you have experience with natural language processing, you might know that um, getting the computer to understand English is one of the most difficult tasks and one of the most crucial tasks. Um, so we're looking to use these large language models to uh, improve the, our understanding of the emails to, so that we can uh, do the previous five capabilities uh, better. And this is a work in progress. So there are a couple different ways that our business partners can engage with uh, the IEM product uh, if they're interested in using this for their email inboxes. So the first is a more sort of classical data science approach, a data science engagement, which is where uh, there would be a team of maybe a couple data scientists, maybe a couple data engineers, um, that would work to build the business a bespoke model for their use case. Um, so this has the advantage of being of providing them with a custom model for their use case, um, which allows us to tackle more complex use cases because they have the data scientists there uh, working on the data, um, you know, back and forth with the subject matter experts, um, etc. And another advantage is that we can integrate with any email system that they might be using because of the data engineers working on the project. Uh, but the trade-off is that there's a longer engagement period um, and it's also more costly because you have a whole team of people working on your, on your project. And that's not um, necessary for every engagement that we have at the bank. So the other mode that we could have is a, more of a self-serve model. So this uses automated classification um, and triage of emails. Um, it's self-serve, so it doesn't require the data scientist and the data engineer, which means that it can be done very quickly. And um, it's, it's much less expensive. You, you don't have a whole team of people working for you. Um, however, the trade-off is that right now our pipeline is just for Outlook. So now I'd like to talk to you about one of the business cases where we implemented IEM uh, with a real business team at the bank to provide them value. So this is the commercial client email inbox. So who this team is, uh, it's a bunch of email inboxes across the bank that receive emails from uh, commercial clients as well as from frontline staff. And like I mentioned before, they can get emails about a really huge variety of topics. Um, can you order me more checks? All the way up to maybe the fraud example that I mentioned earlier. And when we engaged this team, the problem was that they were exceeding the SLA for lots of their emails. So they were taking a really long time to reply to people's emails. Um, and many of the processes were manual. So they had this key manager who was reading through all the emails. They were doing the automation, uh, the authentication um, manually. Um, their, their, pro their process was hugely manual, which is a problem for scale. Um, if you receive, if all of your processes are manual and you receive more emails, um, it, it's difficult to scale up without hiring more people. So now I'd like to show you a demo um, from our business partners of what it looked like when we implemented the IEM solution for their team. Before we have IQ solutions deployed, Q managers need to pick up each email on SEM to read through in order to determine if email needs to act or remove. After IQ solutions deployed, Without any manual effort, all incoming emails will be tagged based on IQ model prediction on email intent to classify an incoming email in real time. As you can see on the SEM screen, IQ action, IQ deprioritize, IQ priority, IQ purge. For email predicted as no action, the solution will tag the email as IQ deprioritize. In this example, you can see in the reason three code, IQ pre-populate the prediction outcome as IQ deprioritize. 
for email predict as no action, the solution will tag the email as IQ purge. In this scenario, you can see the reason three code pre-populate as IQ purge. For email classified as action, the solution will apply additional business logics to classify an action email as regular, priority, or high priority. The visibility IQ solution provided is not only at the queue level for user to identify inquiries need action quickly, but also add additional value when certain types of inquiry sensitive to urgency or client experience. When email intents identify as fraud, stop payment, or check issue related, as a predefined business logic, IQ will tag the email as high priority on SCM and also pre-populate the relevant reason. So this uh, demo was really, I mean, it's not our production environment, but this is, this is what the IEM solution looks like in uh, production for, the, um, uh, for this email team. And so we've rolled it out um, to all of the email inboxes that are part of this team. We're processing more than 50,000 emails a month, and it's got 100% adoption. All of the people answering emails for these email inboxes are using the IEM tool. And because of this tool, we've saved about uh, six FTEs, so six people's worth of time. And we've liberated these people from doing things that, uh, like queue management, um, to working on things that really do require a human, like answering the email. When I introduced this problem to you, I talked about uh, two areas that the business was concerned about when we started our engagement with them. The first was the SLA. So they were um, about one to five days, taking longer than they said they would to answer your email. And now we're meeting the SLA. They have a 24-hour SLA, and the team is able to meet their SLA uh, with help of the IAM tool. The other problem that I discussed was the manual, that it was a manual process. Um, and so the manual assignment of emails, um, when we, before we engaged with them, 100% of the emails were being assigned by a human. Now we've got 40% of them being auto-assigned, so without a human at all, and the rest are tagged with certain keywords that help the uh, queue manager understand what the email is about. So they don't have to read the whole email thread anymore. They can look at these tags to help them make the decision of routing, where to route to this email. So we've given, Joel and I have given you a couple examples of the stuff that uh, we at uh, the Innovation Hub have been working on. And I think it's really interesting. I think that our, truly RBC is a great place to be a technologist. Um, and if you're interested in becoming a technologist at RBC, we do have a few job roles that are posted. So um, you're more than welcome to take a look at those or come and talk to uh, Joel or me after the talk. Um, but on that note, we'll uh, open it up to questions. So right now, the, um, we do collect the business process metadata as a part of the event engine. So we can capture all of the events associated with the business process. Um, what, um, you know, what we described has been used on a few business processes, but that process does scale until that final step of, of the SME. So we're iterating on kind of what's the best way, especially for the final step, um, to, to involve the person at that point. But kind of everything until then is, is automated. Cool. I think, thank you very much for your great presentation. I have two questions uh, regarding a large language model. First one is, uh, does RBC have plan to evaluate how those models can help your developer, data scientists do their job, how that would affect your talent strategy? The second question is like, uh, how RBC gonna evaluate the risks of uh, uh, data security or the customer data privacy by using those large language model? Thank you. Thank you very much for the questions. So I think that you've raised two really good and salient points about large language models. They're good, and there's risks associated with them. And those are both things that uh, the bank is considering. 
So yeah, we are looking into large language models where, where there's teams whose purpose is to, to look into that sort of stuff, to understand how could we use it at the bank and uh, to make um, the employees and clients' um, lives easier. But you're completely bang on in that uh, there's a real privacy issue. So that's, uh, that's really the focus of sort of uh, the research that's going on at the bank right now is how to do this, um, how to do it on-prem, how to do it in a safe way that uh, won't expose clients' data to, to other people. Hello, yeah, hi. Uh, thanks very much for the presentation. So my question is really already been asked by the previous uh, uh, person, but I, I just want to clarify a little bit about uh, what the language models. So is it going to be the kind of existing language models that are out there already that the, the bank is planning on um, using, uh, or it, uh, are you planning on uh, developing in-house models uh, that probably like would address the privacy concerns as well? Sure, that's another great question. Um, so I don't think that we're really committed one way or the other. The bank is really open to exploring um, all sorts of opportunities um, while keeping the risks in mind. So um, there's, there, I mean, I'm sure if you have experience with natural language processing and these types of models, you know that you could use it out of the box, you could do some uh, domain-specific uh, retraining, or you could develop your own. Um, I, th I don't think the bank is really committed to one of these three paths over the other one. Um, uh, so it, it's still sort of, you know, the bank is willing to do, and the technologists there are willing to do what provides business value while still keeping these privacy concerns in mind. And as a quick follow-up question, so does the bank typically hire people who specialize in NLP for this type of tasks, or? Uh... Yeah, yeah, um, there's definitely teams that uh, the people working on them are, are completely NLP specialists, yeah. Yeah, or deep learning specialists, or reinforcement learning specialists, or like whatever the task might be. Uh, hi, nice talk about uh, using large language models to expedite your uh, RPC's prediction process. Uh, my question was similar to the earlier question asked earlier, but this time related to RPC's own internal security. By using large language models, uh, it has been shown that it can be uh, compromised by using other large language models uh, through uh, maybe prompt injections. So, is do you think uh, you, even even if you have uh, even if you have you are not using those existing available large model models and you are you have prepared the models from scratch you can still use the external models that are available publicly and basically generate those similar emails that would pass rbc's check criteria and maybe security as well so what uh, security are in place deal with that. Yeah, so the audience is raising a ton of, of really fabulous points about the security and the privacy. And I, that's, that's a really sort of natural thing to happen. As new technology is, uh, becomes popular like this, um, there's all of the hype, um, so all of the cool things that it can do. But we have to keep those expectations realistic in uh, what can it do and what uh, risks might it raise, like what, what sort of problems, what uh, what could happen if somebody is using this maliciously or irresponsibly or something like that? So I really love the focus that the audience is, is bringing to this. And I have to say, um, if you are passionate about data privacy and security, well, there might be a role for you at the bank. Yeah, hi. Um, my question is more around quality control. So while you have these systems that are queuing or managing the queuing and sending it to anyone, uh, what if somebody writes in about something important and gets deprioritized by the system, how do you catch it? That's a great question. And that's really something 
So, so this is something that I personally find really interesting, and that is how does data science fit into a business process? Um, so we all can, you know, go on Kaggle and do a data set and, and do data science sort of in, in the void. But in the enterprise, that's not how it works. You're just one tool in a entire process, in a business process. And so you have to think about these kinds of things. You have to think about what happens when my model is wrong, because it invariably will be wrong. Um, and so that, that is part of risk management, um, which is something that I find super interesting. Um, so when you have a process, when you have a risk, what sort of controls do you put in place uh, to mitigate that risk, to ensure that, exactly as you say, we don't deprioritize a really important email. Um, so that was something that we worked together with the business uh, to design a risk resilient process that even if, like, even when really our machine learning models made an error, um, how can we mitigate the impact of that to the client? So um, I won't get into all of that right now because this is a data science talk, but one of the thing, one of the controls that we have in place is that a human looks at all of the emails, regardless of what um, he was in, there is a human reading the emails. So your, your email won't accidentally get deleted and never seen again. Like there's, there's a human, um, and very intentionally in this process uh, for exactly as you say, mitigating this risk. So great question. Great. Um, it, yeah, this is more just around the innovation hub in general. And I think when RBC announced that they were gonna build it, I think that was a commitment that they were gonna build everything in the house, or a lot of things anyways. But there's also the, a lot of great machine learning data science solutions out there. But where do you see the, you know, the, the, the advantage of having to build this in house in terms of like quality versus the, the speed that you can get from just buying something? I'll do my best to answer it. I think it's a great question. Um, I, I don't think, I mean, I, I can't like opine uh, on behalf of RBC for exactly what the messaging was um, to that effect, but I don't think that there's a commitment to build everything in-house. I think when it comes to technology, sort of the, it makes me think of the slide I had about data strategy. There's always a decision about, you know, to build or to buy. Um, and even lots of these solutions have so many parts that they might be a mix of both. Even, you know, it makes me think of the question about when you have a platform, do you have kind of a monolithic, uh, one, one size fits all or something, just many things versus do you mix and match different capabilities? Um, this is very much in the same vein, I'll repeat it, and it's sort of the unsatisfactory kind of architect's answer, but I think the answer is it depends, and it depends on the context, and you have to make those decisions on a case-by-case -case basis. I, I just have a question about like, when you build the tool that can help uh, like increase the efficiency, is that like issue that um, the user will kind of highly depends on this tool and never check again the whole uh, like content of the email and just basically fully leave what is for the priority or something? So uh, I think that in this particular case, um, that's not really a problem because we're not using the tool to action any of the emails. Um, client experience is really important to RBC, and um, I think it, it's, it's really important um, that the client, you know, has a positive experience. And so it is even like once it's assigned to someone, even if it was assigned manually, it is, uh, the human is reading the email in order to be able to action it because these emails contain requests. Um, so uh, regardless of how it gets there. Um, to be sent to the employee, it definitely needs the human to read it. Can I follow up on that? Of course. Um, what it makes me think of more generally, um, I think it's a great, a fantastic question. And it makes me think of, there's kind of a very classic paper on the topic, I don't know if it's the first time to sort of post this, but it calls the, called the ironies of automation. And I think that the that more general problem of that you posed is, is inescapable. And I think, um, I can't speak to you know, in the email context, but I think that almost the solution is the first step is just being aware of it. And in the same spirit as like always think about risk and mitigating risks, anytime there's automation, I think that risk is present and, and needs to be you know, mitigated. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.